And my whole point of going through this, there we found it. Was it a button? No. Yeah. <laughs> Who keeps shutting that button off? We got to find out, man. But whoever keeps shutting that button off, we're going to smack their fingers. Hey, for <laughs> you that have been listening in uh, out there in internet land, uh, just welcome. Glad you're back with us. But technical difficulties, but uh, not nothing wrong with the people running it. It's just where the people that aren't, they're usually here that aren't tonight. But what I was just saying, anyway, was here in Revelation 20, we go into this thing, and, and my Bible's even got the subtitle. It doesn't mean that, that John wrote that in there, but about the thousand years. And what I was just saying was that I didn't go back to, as I approached this whole book of Revelation, I believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I, and I've said this before, I know, but I just want to reiterate it. I, because I believe with all my heart that one of the greatest things that Satan's ever done is discourage us from reading this book. And I believe it's because he has used preachers to make it so difficult that the rest of us feel like, what's the use of even trying to look at it because it's hard to understand. And on its surface, it is because it throws out these things. You've got one thing and another and another and another and another. And it's like, how does any of this make sense? And, but yet, if you stop and you consider it, it was not written to conceal, but to what? Reveal. It was written to make clear, not to muddy the waters. It was written to a church that um, somewhere in the area of, and, and it's not exact, but somewhere in the area of 60 years had been in existence since Jesus Christ had left this earth. And in that 60 years already, you know, maybe two to three at the most um, generations of people, but already the church had begun to get off track. Already that church that was sold out to Christ and the blood of Christ was upon them, that they began to shed their own blood for him. Many different ones had already gone ahead and changed the whole purpose of the church, and it had become much more of what it is today in our America to where it's far more of a fellowship, social kind of a club than it is truly the active living church of the, of the living God, the living Jesus Christ. And that it's weakened in the sense that we choose to almost, almost identify more with the world and, and to be like them and there were periods where there was a self-righteousness, and I'm sure there were churches like that. But, but as a whole, the church had become worldly. And Jesus, wanting to and loving his bride and wanting to come back and get her, knew that what was going to keep him from coming back was going to be waiting for the Father to say yes. But God the Father certainly wasn't about to turn around and to send Jesus back to a bride that wasn't prepared. And so this letter, I believe, and, and this is my interpretation, there's nothing in the Bible that says this, but in just looking at it from at least what we can identify with Christ as a man that walked on this earth that could identify with us in the flesh because he took on flesh, that, you know, if, if we parallel this thing with the bride, you see the father, you know, looking at his son and the son says, but dad, I really love her. And you see the dad looking at the bride and go, oh man, you can do better than this. And he sees the bride and all that was poured out with the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit coming. And instead of the church thriving and drawing from that and being Christ-like, rather instead the church is trying to see how much of the world can we still live in and still call ourselves Christians. And so Jesus then, let's say in my mind at least, that he begs the Father and says, well, at least let me reach out to her. Let me write her a love letter and tell her what needs to happen so that she'll be ready for me to come back. And that's my glasses that I put on when I read this book. It's the heartbeat of Christ to his bride saying, I want to come and consummate this marriage. But you're living like you're cheating on me instead of living wholeheartedly for me. And what's it going to take? And so what we have then from the beginning was the churches that were written to, and you can see some of these tendencies in them, that although there were some faithful, there were also many that weren't. That although the Ephesian church was right on target with some of the things, the one thing that they had lost was their first love. That there were some of them even teaching worldly principles, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And there were places that Satan even dwelt right in the midst of the church. And he said, but I cheer you on because you're at least doing right. But as a whole... The one word that keeps coming back over and over, at least five of the seven churches, was repent, 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 repent. And then he goes into these stories and showing John these visions. And you've got John limited to not be able to just tell his story like he would or like I would tell you if it was me that Jesus Christ was speaking to. 
Um, but John can't do that because the prison that he's in wouldn't likely let a letter like that go back out to the churches. But something as wild and wacky and as crazy as this book of Revelation seems to be, they said this is perfect. And much like our pundits do with TV, depending on which side of the uh, fence you're on politically and all like that, but many of them try to make politicians look extremely foolish. And that's what the prisoner or the guards would have done at the prison said, finally, look, John's gone insane. Let this message go out because that church won't get anything out of this. Unless you have the Holy Spirit, unless you have the rest of the word of God. And again, my whole approach to the book of Revelation is the more we know of the rest of the scriptures, the more sense Revelation makes. And Jesus Christ, being the same yesterday and today and forever, when he was a teacher on this earth, did he make teachings difficult? No, he simplified them compared to the rest of the world. He actually made the teachings understandable. The people could relate with him. He talked in parables. And so the approach to all this comes into play then where that's what I've tried to do is to use wherever I could the passages in Revelation, tie them back into other passages that give us insight into what he's saying, realizing that when it's all said and done, the biggest part that he's trying to do is twofold. One is to make the devil more evil, and I always spell the devil, small d, capital E, V, capital, or capital E, capital V, capital I, capital L, D, evil, because that's what he is. I don't even want to give him the respect. I never capitalize Satan. I don't want to give him that much respect. And, but it's the idea of this book was Jesus was try, trying to get his church of the world to look at and realize how utterly sinful and evil, how the end that Satan promises more than he's going to deliver. And he doesn't, even when he gives things to you, it's all with the purpose of taking back where God, on the other hand, is so much more holy and godly and almighty than we ever dreamed. It's your choice. Which do you want? But they're not two things side by side, blurred by just a few little lines. They're complete opposites of the spectrum. And so he presents this thing of God versus Satan and Jesus in the middle saying, I died to take you, free you from this, to deliver you to this. Which do you want? So when I come to this passage in chapter 20, it talks about the thousand years. Knowing that various millennial theories, and I'm not going to get into all those, and some of you might want to go out telling me, oh, I know what this means because so-and-so said, and that very well may be true. I'm not here tonight to tell any of you what you have to believe. I'm going to read it, and I will share with you at least just some of the ponderings at least. And as I sweat, and the reason I don't feel prepared or ready is I never did get that conclusive feeling from the Lord other than the fact, preach what you've got. And I'm not trying to excuse myself. I'm saying up front, I feel um, ill-equipped to be able to do this. But I want to look at with you some of the things that taking the Bible and reading it from where, what it says about itself and about us and about Christ. And let's see what we can do with it. Because I'm not really believing with all my heart, at least, that all these millennial theories that churches have argued over and split fellowships with I, I seriously doubt that they're going to actually be what Jesus was even talking about. But we do know he meant something, so what can we get from this? If you will, let's pray. Father and God, I humbly bow before you. Um, and there's a part of me that, um, God, I feel inadequate, but I, I, I am. I always am, and unless it's you with. But at the same time, Lord, I feel like it's healthy. I would rather stand here and be a preacher that tells the people are listening, that uh, I don't understand it all than I would to get up here and pontificate and pretend that I know everything. And I thank you, Lord, that there are things in your word that we can read one time and we get one thing out, we read another time and we see something different. And it's a part of, I think, your great wisdom, how the, your word can have layers to it. And it doesn't mean that it's either true or false, that type of thing. It's just that as we go through life and walk with you, we suddenly are given insights to things that we didn't see before or application to things that oftentimes through our failures, we suddenly realize that's what you were saying. And so tonight, God, I, I do want my folks, I want the friends that are here and those that are listening in to, to feel freedom, freedom to look and to, Lord, to study on their own. And I never want, Lord, this church, or nor would I want your people in other churches to ever be absolutely dependent on the pastor preacher, because it's not about that. It's being dependent on you. And God, at best, I mean, 
It's not even the moonlight compared to the sunlight. The best, I'm a flashlight. And yet you told us all that we're the light of the world. And even flashlights, Lord, can make a difference in the dark. And so tonight, Lord, as we delve into and start to read these verses that really aren't as difficult to read as some of them are, but God, this thing about this thousand years, what were you saying? What did you mean? Or what all do you mean by it? And so tonight, just help us as we delve into it and we go on an adventure. And God, that what I'm doing right now might just be the beginning of what you want to keep doing. <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. <laughs> but it might just be the beginning of what you want to do with each of us as we go on our journey with you. And I give you thanks, Lord. If we knew it all, it wouldn't take much faith. But I thank you that this is a faith walk. And yet there are things you've given us that we can stand on that are your truth, your absolutes. And we seek those in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So with that said, Revelation 20, let's read here then this uh, first part of it or whatever. So we wrapped up last week with uh, all that's gone on. And there's a great deal there in uh, chapter 19. And uh, we see that the uh, beast and the false prophet get thrown into this burning sulfur, this fiery lake of burning sulfur. So we read in chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. So John, remember now, this book isn't written chronologically, so that makes it difficult, but neither is the Bible in the Old Testament either, you know, and some of the new. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's there. And yet John is like a kid in a candy store or better than that, maybe a, a, an eight-year-old at Disney World for their first time where they just look around, oh, wow, oh, wow, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want some of that, let me eat this, let me drink that. You know, and, and that's kind of what John's like because these things just keep popping up and being revealed. And so you've got to understand that it's not like God took him and slowly explained this to him and charted these things all out. No, he just kept showing him these things. So I presume that this followed right after the other, but there's nothing that says it did. But the next thing that he tells us that he saw, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. So it was clear to him he was still on this earth, what, so to speak, or at least he saw this angel leaving heaven and coming down to earth. And he says, and he had this key to the abyss, and he's holding in his hand this great chain. Now, there's a part of this I really like because I love the idea that, you know, the bad guy is finally going to get captured and chained up. Finally, instead of Jesus being chained up there in the Garden of Gethsemane and taken into a false trial, now we're finally going to get justice. And, and suddenly what's going to happen is the devil's finally going to get his due. And this great chain comes with this angel and he's going to lock him up, right? That sounds great. It says he sees the dragon. I like that. And just in case John says we don't understand what Jesus revealed to him then was it was the dragon, it's that ancient serpent, it's the devil, and it's Satan. And so if you've ever wondered, and these are pictures given throughout the Old and New Testament, different names that are used, they're all one and the same, right? And uh, so he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. Okay, I can buy that for a thousand years. He's locked up. The question is, what thousand years, all right? He threw him into the abyss and he locked and he sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And then it goes on to say, and after that, he must be set free for a short time. John then saw next, I saw the thrones on which were seated those that had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received his mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead didn't come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection because the second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for how long? A thousand years. So there's a lot of thousand years going on here. I mean, I tried to number them out there, and, and there's at least uh, between the thousand or a thousand that it's mentioned like six different times, okay? Right here in this small little area, I went back to look to see if it's talked about much anywhere else. And there were a couple of places that it was, and, and it was nothing big or revolutionary to us. I mean, most of us, the one in Psalms points to it, as well as the one that we know in Peter, where... It just simply says what? With God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is just like a day. Now, 
from a human perspective, that's confusing. But when you're the eternal God, it's no big deal. I mean, what I like about that, and, and I could spend time just talking about that, so I'll take a little, but, but when you think about it, that's a pretty cool way to live, isn't it? Because we're so regulated by time. I mean, even at church, we've got to get some things done. We've got to start on time. We've got to end on time because people got other things they've got to do because it's time to go eat. It's time to go do this. It's time for bed. It's time for, you know, we're all wrapped up in time. And yet we really don't count our life the way we ought to, even though that's what time was designed to do so we could number our days. But we instead, we try to see how much we can jam into a day. And then we wonder either why we're wore out or why life is so unfulfilling. But God is kind of laid back and cool, California cool almost. Because with him, it's like a thousand years just like that. See, I can't snap very good, can I? A thousand, thank you for helping me out. A thousand years is just like that. And yet, a day is sometimes to God like a thousand years. And boy, I've had a few of those, right? I really like the days that go by quicker than the ones that just drag on and on and on. But this picture of God that way, what it's saying is what? Well, the biggest thing is God's not going to be hustled or hurried. He's got his own beat of his own drum that he's going to go by. The other part that's good about that for me is I think because he's not in such a hurry, he is able to go ahead and although he would see the sin that I committed next in my life. He's able to see me after that sin in the blood of Christ. That's good news, is it not? That he doesn't panic the moment I sin. It's not like some imagine and I'm kicked out of heaven instantly. As soon as I do it, they get the eraser out to blot out my name from the... No, man. I mean, God sees it as it unfolds. Not being a parent, I can only presume that it's apparent to me that for you that are, that, man, you can look back and you can see that that first nine months took quite a while, didn't it? But then after that baby was born, there were things that were slow, but it was rapidly progressing. And then it just seems like it was nothing until they were going to kindergarten for their first day and you cried your heart out. And then they're going to first grade, and then on and on, and now they're graduating from high school or college or whatever it may be. Didn't take very long, did it? But we know how many years it took, but it doesn't seem like it. Can you relate with that? And I'm not sharing that just so I've got something to say. I want you to comprehend that this is the world that God lives in. He's not regulated by time, but he uses time. And yet to him, time is not going to speed him up nor slow him down because He's in every single moment. And that means to me, if a day is like a thousand years, what it means to me is that when I stop and pray to him, I've got his full undivided attention as if I was the only person on earth praying. But he does the exact same thing with every one of you and everybody else around the world that ever stops to pray to him. Why? Because he doesn't have to hurry up and get through my prayer to do something else. He's God. And I share this with you because I, I think it helps me at least to begin to put this thousand-year thing into a whole different category. I think that man wants to figure it out because they want to be the one that knows what it is and they can't wait to get to heaven and go, pick me, pick me, because I know. And I think there are going to be several people in heaven going to be a little bit surprised when it goes, I didn't have anything to do with it, Steve, or whoever. Because I think God's just that wise. Not just he's a wise guy, but I mean, I think he's got to have a sense of humor. But I think that those people that believe and they puff themselves up believing they know it all, he's going to kind of put them in their place because we saw that Jesus did that with some of the religious leaders that thought they knew it all. Even Pilate knew he was innocent, and Jesus knew that he knew he was innocent. But Jesus didn't try to coerce him or anything else. Just do what you're going to do, man. And so I want you to see this with God. But isn't that cool to know that he is not rushed when you and I go to pray? I'm not so sure, but why that's when you're really not just at church, but being the church. Have you ever noticed you lose track of time? 
but the, what's difficult, you can be at church, but if you really are just at church, but you're not becoming or being, experiencing the, the idea of being with the body of Christ, because you're planning on something else you've got to get to next. And that keeps us from being able to be absorbed in the moment. But I've often said that for me, I mean, I feel very fortunate that when church is good, and I'm not talking about when I'm preaching, I'm talking about in any situation, and it can be on TV as I'm watching, it can be at conferences I've been to or preaching events at other churches I've gone to and stuff like that. You know, when church is good, you lose track of time. Why? Because you're in the spirit and you're experiencing eternity. Because eternity isn't sandwiched by time. Time is just a sliver in the midst of all of it. I mean, we don't know how long time went on before God ever said, let there be an earth and let there be light. We don't know how long it was between the beginning of the forming of the earth and when Satan was thrown to the earth. Or was it the earth completed as we know it? Or was it the earth that was shapeless and void that that's when he was? Saying? I don't know. But, you know, to God, it's all there. And he can see that as vivid as it just happened. But he can also see what it's going to be like when the end comes in the last judgment and he finally gets to welcome his kids to the table. And I share that with you because that's what to me is pretty vital about just reading the word in general, not taking it for granted, but not trying to always put it into this timetable and figure out what's next, but rather instead to know that God's just in this complete control over it. And with him, it doesn't really make any difference because a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is just like a day. I think he relates with us. I think because of Jesus, Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. I think that's why we see times, like I mentioned here recently, when Lazarus' you know, sister said, hey, Lazarus is sick unto death. And Jesus said, it's not time to go. He didn't actually say that. He said, let's not go right away. They thought they would just jump on and let's go. And he's like, no, not yet. And then what, a few days later, he says, okay, it's time to go. And they're like, I thought we weren't going. See, because they're humans, they want to hurry up and get going. We ought to be there. Jesus is divine. And he said, no, we'll wait for the right time. So I want to give that to you because that's one thing I hope can make some sense to you tonight, at the very least in the midst of my ramblings here, that that can make some sense to you about your walk with God and, and understanding that one of the assets that God, that we have by God being our Father, one of the great assets that we've got is that Man, he gives us his undivided attention because he's not constrained by time. And he is so God that he can look at us as if we're the only one. And that's why he wants us to share every moment with him. At the same time then, at the same time, uh, then we also have then these things, these dispensations or epochs, E-P-O-C-H-S, of time. And it's a variety of things that go on. There are various words that are used, generation. This generation will not disappear until these events have happened. When Jesus was talking about the, uh, you know, one stone will not be left upon another. Uh, he talks about that, you know, that this generation will not die until he comes back. But you see, that can become confusing because, again, we immediately think generation is like the generation of, of what we are part of. You know, our grandparents were a generation, our parents were a generation, we're a generation, our kids are a next generation. And we think in that regard... But to God, you see, he looks bigger than that. And I believe that we're still in the church generation. I think prior to that, it was pre-Christ, then there was a time of Christ, and then since then, it's the church age. Now, that's just a personal opinion. I won't arm wrestle any of you over that or anything else. But I see passages and things that Jesus said that talked about from one generation to the next. I see others that he gives this picture of he'll return and there's some, though, that took it literal to the point that they believe, and I can't even think of their names right now, but it's a group of Christians that believe that Jesus came back in like 70 A.D. and Jerusalem was destroyed, and one thing I like that happened, and he came back and he fulfilled it. Now, what they go on from there, I don't know. And, and maybe it's just because I want to stay blind to it or whatever, but it's just hard for me to believe that's it. But I don't care. I mean, I'm for God doing it. It's like there's the pre-millennialist, there's the post-millennialist, and it's all about this thousand years. Is it going to happen before, during, after, whatever? And, and I really do like what I did hear one guy say one time. He said, I'm a pan-millennialist. And I was like, and sure enough, he explained it. He said, I believe it all pan out just the way God planned. 
you know, and that's kind of what I'm into. I just believe God's going to do it. So, you know, I've shared with you last year that one of the things that I understood in our day and age right now and, and the insanity, the edge of insanity that sometimes we live on, I think is built up because of these things that we think we can control. And people that I would talk to get exasperated because there's so many things that are out of their control. And man, I mean, I'm like, I'll be real honest with you. There's very little I can control. When it comes right down to it, there is next to nothing I can control. That the only thing that I can control or have self-control over with the help of the Holy Spirit, being spirit-controlled then, right? The only thing I can do is how I handle what comes at me. Because I can't determine what's going to come to me, right? I can only handle it or let it handle me. The only thing I can do is I do have control because there's nobody that can worship God for me. There's nobody that can read my Bible for me. There's nobody can say my prayers for me, and I welcome you to pray for me, but you can't say my prayers. There's nobody that can witness or testify for me. That's all mine. I am responsible, and I will be accountable to God for that. There's none of you that can make me say anything like that. There's none of you that can truly make me mad, even though you can do things that I could blame on you and say, well, it really made me mad when you did this. But you don't have that much control over me. I choose whether I get mad. I choose whether I get angry. And I'm saying all this for a purpose because I want us to recognize that really when it comes down to these things with God, that, you know, it's not about us having even full knowledge. It's about us having enough knowledge that we realize how do we submit to God in the midst of it and give him the glory. And when we are at peace and quit trying to control the rest of the world and believe that our next thing that we say is going to change the world or if everybody would just take my side and whatever it is that we're arguing over that everything would be great no it won't because we aren't in control and the sad thing is we live out of control a lot of times because we get so busy with these other things and this is the part that makes it difficult for me to believe because one of the things that said for this thousand years he would not be able to deceive and man, I see a lot of believers that are deceived. And I get deceived, thinking that if I could just control this or change that, it would change everything. And the truth is, no, I'm very limited in the scope of what God's given me to do that nobody else can do for me. Now, together, there are things that we can do. And when you agree and I agree that God's calling us together to do something, that's, that's tremendous because then we're working together for that. But outside of that, what we really are doing is we're letting the devil wind our clock up and God just still being the regulator going tick, tock, tick, tock. But the devil's all the time trying to get what? No, we got to get this, got to do that. And we lose our peace and we can sometimes lose our mind, can't we? And so saying that, let's go back to this because I'm not, again, trying to dance around this. But I think it's vital that we look at throughout the Bible that there were periods or epochs, uh, time sequence things that God went ahead and did and allowed. We know that he, uh, there was this time with Adam and Eve, but we don't even know how long, how many days they were in the garden, do we? It seems like it's pretty quick because it's right there right after they get there. But we don't know if it took months or years. We don't know what happened and what it was like with their kids and how many they end up having. Uh, we know that they had the two, and obviously there were kids that they had later on as well, but we don't know all those things. And my whole point being is, but there was a period when man began. There was a period when the earth was formed, but was it formed in seven 24 hour or six 24-hour periods, or was it formed in 6,000 years? It says a day, but whose day? God's or man's. Now, I have no problem believing he could do it in seven minutes or six minutes, you know, and he rested on the seventh. I know that there are people that believe, at least what I've read before, according to the Bible and what people have figured it out, and I've not tried to do that, and it's not because I couldn't ever figure it out. It's just like, what was the purpose of it? But I know that there are some people, and it's really intriguing, that they believe that the world at this point in time a man's time on the earth has been about 6,000 years according to the biblical record. And the amazing thing is, if that's correct, 
we're getting real close into that seventh day. And what do we do on the seventh day? God rested, didn't he? It's complete. Now, it doesn't make any difference how old we are. But people argue about that. Of course, to make things fit within the evolution, you've got to stretch it out and make it billions of years old. I don't know, but I don't find that's worth arguing about. But I am intrigued to know, God, what did you mean by this? So once again, let's look at this. So this angel comes out. He seizes this great, he has this great change, seizes the dragon, Satan himself, and binds him for a thousand years. And not only did he bind him, but he threw him into the abyss and he locked and sealed it. It's as if then he's totally separated to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he'll be set free for a short time. Well, for us to be able to look at this, I think, you know, last week I know I touched on several passages that de dealt with deceit or don't be deceived. And, and it comes up there in our scriptures. I mean, the biggest one, I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, then we had Galatians 6. And Galatians 6, what did it say? But don't be deceived. God won't be mocked, right? You will sow what you reap. And you have the two choices. You can either sow to the spirit or you can sow to the flesh. But you're still going to reap whichever one it is that you sow to. So there's things said about deceit. Let me read a few others to you. I'm not going to take time to turn to them. In Matthew 24, where he's talking about the future, there when his disciples say, well, when will this happen and what are going to be the signs about your return? He said, many will come in my name saying or claiming I am the Christ and they will deceive many. In verse, chapter 24, verse 11, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. In verse 24 of chapter 24 of Matthew, false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So there we have right there in Jesus' own teaching about there would be many times of this deception. And uh, it goes on down from there, and we can read then in Romans, it says in verse, chapter 7, verse 11, for sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. Romans 16, 18, for such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. 1 Corinthians 3, 18, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he's wise by the standards of the age, he should become a fool so that you can become wise. So we can even deceive ourselves. Now, does this just mean, and as I go through these, I mean, what my mind's whirling and asking as I was looking at, because it said Satan won't be able to deceive the nations. Now, so is he just talking about Satan on the big picture of the whole globe? And I found it interesting that the nations is actually the very same word that he used when he gave us his great commission and said, go the, into all the world. And he said to the nations. And so Satan's not going to be able to deceive the nations, but the question is, are we willing to evangelize the nation? Or are we counting on somebody else to do that? So, but within this, so there's plenty in the New Testament about deceive. I, let me read on, if you will. Um, I'm going to jump on down because I covered a couple of those that I mentioned. Chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those that are disobedient. Colossians 2, 4. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Second. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come till the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Uh, then we, have the, we get into Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 14. Ladies, sorry, but Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman that deceived and became a sinner. I, just in case you didn't know that was in the Bible, that's what he said there. So Paul, of course, writing that, the male chauvinistic you know, kind of guy he was. Um, in... Uh, that was First Thessalonians chapter, or First Timothy, excuse me, two fourteen. Uh, then we had. It seemed like I had another one. Second Timothy uh, three. While evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, Titus chapter three. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions. James chapter one says, "Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says." So you see, there's others that would deceive, and, and 1 John, even one of my favorite passages, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And uh, then the backing up again in uh, 1 Timothy, I knew there's one other I was looking for, I just found 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. So in looking at this, I could say to you, 
I feel fairly authoritative taking the scriptures and let them display this or explain this, then if Satan was bound for a thousand years and he wasn't there to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore till his thousand years were ended, then how come we can still be deceived? And is it because Satan's doing it or is it because of our evil nature and what's going on that way? And does it mean that there will be then this thousand-year period? And that's what some have gone to believe, is there's going to be a thousand years of just peace and prosperity, and that uh, during that time that you know, everybody will see everything for as it is. Well, what did that do for the other people that didn't get? Is that like the gospel of second chance? And again, I'm not, I can't draw a conclusion. I'm telling you that when I try to picture where this thousand years is, because there's a part of it that I could look at and say, I truly personally believe that really, since Jesus Christ handled Satan from the cross, when Satan thought that he threw the death blow, and Jesus got a chance to come back from the grave and go, checkmate, you know? And one of my favorite things that I see Jesus do is coming out going, and the devil and the rest of the demons that were, if they were partying or whatever, but going, uh-oh, you know, this is not good for us. But basically, I mean, that's the point that deception was handled and the truth was revealed. Not only that, but that's what burdened parts or Paul's heart. And we see and we know that he was deceived prior because he was killing Christians. But once it hit him that Jesus Christ fulfilled all these Old Testament prophecies that he'd read over and over and over again, he became so convinced he was no longer deceived, but saw, man, the Old Testament was full of Jesus. Look, Jesus fits every bit of it. And so Paul was changed from being deceived into where he saw clearly. He saw that no longer could you even get your righteousness from the law. But in fact, it was your bondage and you were set free from that. And that's what he began to share with the Gentiles. But also he kept trying to tell the, the Jews, come on, come on, can't you see this with me? And they couldn't. We know the 12 were deceived, believing that it was going to be an earthly kingdom. But once Jesus finally got it across to them and the Holy Spirit came, suddenly it connected with them and they realized he was never going to be an earthly king. He was the total thing was so he could be a spiritual heavenly kingdom. They'd been deceived, but they could see. And how about you and me? Before we accepted Christ, what were we? We tried to be self-righteous. We thought we were good. We're as good as those people that go to church, whatever it may have been. But finally, we came to the conclusion, we need a savior. And once you did and you realize what Jesus set you free from, we spend the rest of our time understanding and learning what we're free from. So this thousand years, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I lean toward the fact that it's a part of the church age, but how that has to do with Satan being bound and thrown into the abyss and sealed over, because it seems like he'd be stuck in Tupperware, so to speak. You know, sealed, that's what I always think of with that. And you burp it and, the, and he's in there and he can't get out of the box. But all of a sudden, then God's going to let him out of the box. Is that the way it's going to be? Or is it instead where he's chained all right? I remember I was selling uh, in the spring of the year, one year for FFA, was selling garden seeds. And um, I remember stopping by Jim Furrow's house and going by to see, because he always planted a big garden. And so he was one of my customers. So I went by there and dropped off the book and came back to see if he wanted to order anything. And he had this order. But, I was going there now to deliver them, and I knew that he had this more of a hound dog type thing, but he was on a chain, but one of those just junkyard dogs, rah, 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 you know, and, but I wasn't afraid because he's on a chain. The only thing I'd be afraid of is I got inside the chain, right? And so I'm walking up to the door, and he's over there, rah, 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 rah. and so I was stupid enough. I did that, rah, 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 back, you know, became a smart aleck, you know? And he started coming at me, and then I looked, and the end of the chain had broke. And so I was like, whoa, and I ran to the car, you know, to get up on top of it before I got bit, because it scared the time out of me. Well, Satan, I've always looked at as being somewhat that way. I mean, I really, truly believe that we've been set free, that sin, not only sin, but the master of sin no longer has mastery over us, right, because we've been set free in Christ. And so I began to look at it that way, that Satan can still get those that are willing to come within his territory, but he is so limited. Now, is he more limited since the cross? Well, I would say yes. And if you don't believe me, let's go over here to Romans chapter 6 and look at this, because I'd like to look at a few passages here. And, and this goes with even some of the rest of it. And by the rest of it, what I mean is we're going to get into this thing, looking at this thousand years, because as it talks about it, it mentions the first resurrection, the second resurrection, one thing like that, uh, death, second death. And 
And I just, when I look at the resurrection, I, I honestly, and we've looked at it the past few weeks and Sunday morning, you know, but I really truly believe the bodily resurrection of our flesh that turns back to dust, it's going to be brought back together and we're going to be given this glorified body from God designed the way he wanted. No doubt at all in my mind, and that is a resurrection. But this alludes to the fact that there's a resurrection before that. As I try to put that together in my pint-sized logical brain, I go back here to Romans chapter 6 and read this with me, if you will. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul goes, that's ridiculous. By no means. We died to sin. I heard this phrase when I was a kid in a revival one time. This guy said something that was kind of you know, boggled my mind somewhat. And with mind like mine, it doesn't take much to get boggled, you know. But he said, twice born men die once. Once born men die twice. You ever heard that? Just did. Okay, you heard it now, right. Twice born men die once. Once born men, born men die twice. And let's see what this says. He said, by no means. We died to sin. There's a death. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And it implied with our death. We were therefore buried with him. So there's our death. Through baptism into death in order that just as Christ then was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And that's why when we baptize people, we don't put them under and leave them there. We bring them back up, right? A uh, guy told me one time, he said, you really want somebody that understands what wanting Jesus is, keep them under. And when they want Jesus as bad as they want air, then they're ready to be saved. I just don't have the courage to quite do that. I think that they would get up and punch me out, you know. But, but reading on in verse 5, if we've been united with him like this in his death, along with our death, dying to our self, right? Dying to our sin, dying for Christ, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection, the big one. But in the meantime, we have a small one. And the big resurrection that's coming is going to be like Jesus back from the tomb, but only he's going to bring all of us back from the dust. Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. Now, let me ask you, did your body suddenly quit sinning? No, but it's, the purpose is we now can, all right? Now we can. The body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone that's died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Is that just going to be eventually or should it be now? Ought to be now, okay? So if we died with Christ, we believe we will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. Like once and for all meaning once and it's all over. Once and for all includes you and me, all right? He died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul goes on to say, logically, so in the same way, count yourselves what? Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer the parts of your body uh, as sin, or to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those that have been brought from death to life. Offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under the law but under grace. Now, the reason I go back and read this is because, like I said, one of the things about this thousand years had to deal with the, the death and, the, and the, the life, you know, come to life for a thousand years. Well, I want to tell you that I believe that a part of this is pointing towards that, that when I died to myself and I died with Christ, that it freed me from my obligation, the mastery that sin had over me, that that small resurrection right there is a picture of what will take place. But at the same time, I resurrected. And now that I'm set free from this sin because of the blood of Christ and united with him and dying, like he said, if you save yourself, you're going to die. But if you lose your life, you're going to win, right? You're going to live. And that with that then comes about this freedom. Now, does it mean that Satan cannot deceive me? No, Paul wrote and said that there would be people that would even be preachers that would deceive. And in no way am I trying to deceive you tonight. I'm sharing with you 
This is my perspective of what I know about the Bible at this point in time in my life as I try to make sense of this thousand-year thing. But I believe that we're in the church age. And I believe that we're not living victorious like we can. And I'm not saying none of you are. I'm just saying the church as a whole is not living free from sin. I think that we are limping because we're still not been set free. We are, but we just don't know it. We're the elephant that's still tied to the chain that's tied to the three foot stake in the ground and we just don't know we can pull it out but we're to be set free not to be outdone but peter not trying to compete with paul or anything else but let's go back and read in peter and see what he has to say about this because he too mentions this very same thing and gives us this picture of a resurrection and of the fact that we've been set free um in chapter three first peter first peter chapter three and uh, I, I just, I really like, let's pick it up with the paragraph 13. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. So he said, you know, we ought to want to do good, but in the midst of doing good, if it causes a problem, you're still blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Who's they? The rest of the world. People that don't know Christ. Don't fear what they fear. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. And then always be prepared to give an answer to everyone that asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, if we're suffering and we keep smiling, if we're suffering and we don't turn our back, and like Paul said, we don't curse, but we bless, it's going to make the world go, what the crud's wrong with you? Why don't you get even with that person? You just give the reason for the hope you have in you. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those that speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It's better if it's God's will anyway, to suffer for doing good rather than doing evil. Now then we get into this. For Christ died for sins, how many times? Once. For who? All people, all sin. The righteous being Jesus, the unrighteous being me, any of you that will agree. And why did he do that? To bring you to God. And this is a great, great passage to be able to try to explain to somebody. Says, well, what is it about being a Christian? Well, I, I believe that Christ died for sins, And it's not fair, but he was the righteous one for my unrighteousness, and he did it to bring me to God. And so I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, both living in that freedom, but also bringing other people to Christ like he did for me. He goes on to say, he was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the what? By the spirit. And this is one of those, some people call it a controversial passage, but I mean, there's no controversy to it. It is what it says it is. Uh, Through whom the spirit, he went, he went in and preached in the spirits, or to, excuse me, preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Now there, there are whole books written on this. So what was it like? What did Jesus do? Did he go down there and have a church service, a revival? Did he offer an invitation, or was he just pronouncing judgment, or what was it? Don't know. I lean toward the fact that uh, if he had the audience of all, and if it was like in Luke, the story told about the rich man and Lazarus, that maybe he stood there in that great chasm and was able to go ahead and to, to declare and say, this is what we're talking about the whole time. For you that kept the faith, your faith was in me, and you didn't even know it. For you that didn't, and you were offered the opportunity, and you rejected, you rejected me, and you didn't know it. Now you know. I don't know, but uh, it says that he did that. And while he was during that three days and three nights while he was in the tomb, that's what some believe, and I, I'm just willing to say, I just believe it says what it says. But what about those people? They disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. He waited patiently while the ark was being built because he'd already said, man, he was grieved he'd even made man. We know what grief is, don't we? I said, oh, that terrible feeling. I wish I could change this. He was grieved he'd made man. But he waited patiently while Noah built, giving other people a chance as well. In it, though, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through what? The ark. No, through water. And this water symbolizes what? Baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal or taking away of dirt from the body, but the pledge, the consecration, the commitment, the vow is another way to say it. It's like the marriage vows. The pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you, and it goes on to say, and in this school, it's not just what we do, and it's not just the baptism, but it also saves you 
because of the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that cool? It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ that's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. Angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And so the picture here, what I wanted to bring out was, again, I think like Paul said, we identify with Christ in baptism. There's something to that. We buried, we raise up to walk a new life. We raise up to take this new promise of God. It's not because suddenly the flesh no longer has desires, but our heart and spirit are set free. And if we can just convince our mind to where it, oh, it takes control as it should, the mind ought to control the body, we can finally begin to say to ourselves, I am free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And every time that temptation comes, we can say, I don't have to do that anymore. Man, get out of my mind. I want a clean heart, God. Create in me a clean heart. And the whole picture of this being is we don't have to be deceived anymore. And I'm out of time. But I'm pretty convinced that at the very least, deception comes when you don't have the truth. And one of the saddest things in the church is we've got a Bible and we don't really read the truth. And I'm not saying you never read it. I'm just saying, but do we read it like it sets us free? Do we read it and do we use it like the sword of the spirit it's designed to do so that we can tell Satan where he belongs and to leave us alone? You no longer have mastery over me. On the word of Jesus Christ, you no longer have mastery over me. Sometimes I got to tell myself that. Sin, that temptation, no longer has mastery. You can say no to it now in the power of Jesus Christ because he set you free. Steve, you've been resurrected. Don't go back down into the grave again. Can you imagine that? Anybody that would be resurrected, brought back from the dead, that they say, you know, I'm tired of this life. I'm going to go back down. It was kind of cool being in under with the worms. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But that's what we do when we've been set free and we go back to that which enslaves us. So who's deceived? Well, I think James had it right. He said, it's not a matter of merely hearing the word. Do what it says. And so if Satan is chained, it's chained because he no longer, prior to the word of Christ and prior to the cross, I mean, there were the prophets and they were pointing toward, but they even longed, looked longfully into trying to understand what it was that the Spirit was trying to tell them. They spoke the truth, but they didn't have the whole truth. You and I have got the whole truth. Christ completed it. And so this picture is we no longer have to be deceived. And then above and beyond the fact that not only did Christ then set it, but, you know, since the 1600s, the word of God has become available to every human being. I think one of the biggest deceitful things that ever happened was the church without the Bible. Because you were completely reliant upon the preacher or the priest. And like, again, was prophesied. Some of them weren't completely honest or truthful teachers. They were false prophets. And they found out that the pulpit was a great place to manipulate people. And to get you to do what they wanted you to do. And to use guilt to kind of go ahead and make you paranoid. Man. I just want to tell you what the word says, but I want you to read it for yourself. Because this is the way to keep us from being deceived. But again, if you read it with preconceived ideas, you're not going to get as much out of it as when you just read it with that open mind of God. What have you said? What have you spoken? Every word of God will be made true in the end. But it's true now. It will be proven true in the end. And so... I know that doesn't necessarily complete all this whole thing about the thousand years. But I know one thing. If you and I've got the word of God, Satan is bound in our life. But if we have the word of God and we don't use it, we're probably within his chain at the very least. Capable of being deceived because we don't use the truth. So tonight we offer to you, don't force it on anybody just like what we try to do around here just in the sense that he said as often as you do this do it in remembrance of me as often as you meet together and um, so we offer communion but it's not because here this is the magic wand or here take this magic pill it's no man it's so that we stop and we honor Christ we stop and we remember that he is the way the truth and life that he is the word when we read this 
we're reading him. And tonight then, as we take this, we're asking for God to become not just a part of us, but inside and throughout us. So Father and God, tonight, I just pray that you would, once again, guide our thoughts and our hearts with your truth. Lord, let us, once again, covenant with you that, man, my feelings can deceive me. Not necessarily all of them, because there are those feelings that are sincere and that are true and that are about you. And it's what breaks our heart, Lord, or what gives us joy or what puts the hairs up on the back of our neck because we suddenly realize how godly you are and how vile Satan is. But Lord, may it also be that we don't allow just these feelings that we have, that this false flesh to reign, but may we let you reign in our mortal bodies. You, Lord, no longer sin reigning in it, but you and your spirit. May we bear forth the fruit of the Spirit. And God, again, I apologize to you, Lord, if I've missed out on whatever this thousand years is and want to give everybody an answer. But I'd rather at least give them what I do know. And Lord, I pray you fill in the blanks. But Lord, I want you reigning in my life for the next thousand years, meaning forever and ever and ever. I don't want to be deceived forever and ever and ever. And Lord, I pray that tonight that uh, we would recognize what we can do is it's all up to us what we make you to be and how big of a lord and how mighty of a god you are according to how much we let you just dwell within us and we live for you in that name of christ amen